you for coming and thank you all for watching again. And I'm going to start with the obvious. How did the idea for the film first come to mind? Um, so the idea for SM came together because uh, myself and co-writer and director Neil Eli were working uh, with Mencap. Neil works for Mencap full time and was developing a, a play down there with different uh, young adults with learning disabilities who um, wanted to tell stories that weren't necessarily seen on screen and we were kind of workshopping with them what they felt wasn't being put out there on screen in television, media, theatre, kind of, you know, all the different forms of storytelling and sexuality kept coming up time and time again. Um, so Neil developed this amazing play with them down in Eastbourne, the group, Mencap, that he was teaching down there. And um, from that, we kind of then started to um, talk about more themes of sexuality and disability not being shown on screen, and, and it kind of was born from that. Mm -hmm. at, so at what point did yourself and George uh, come to the film uh, because obviously he's uh, having quite a successful career at CBBS now as the first uh, presenter with Down syndrome. So on CBBS, so uh, well, I, you know, you directed it. So you brought the actors on board. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I've worked with Sam for kind of yeah. the last kind of nearing five years now, and um, he was at my house when we kind of came up with the idea to make this film and was sat in the kitchen, and I think it was probably about two o'clock in the morning. Um, well, that's where the best ideas yeah. come to mind, don't <laughs> And I think yeah. we just were like, you're going to be in it? And you were like, yeah. And we were like, great. great. And, and then, then we, we shot it two weeks later. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I feel like it kind wow. Of. Okay. <laughs> How long did it take to film? Uh, two days. And I think oh, from c conception to picture lock was maybe like a month and a bit. Like oh, wow, it was so nothing it was yeah, really quick. quick and we made this for like li very little money it was like 1500 pounds mm -hmm. i think it cost to make um yeah and it was just passion and people coming together that really felt passionate about telling the story mm -hmm. and yeah yeah did you have uh, was it an easy decision to cast for the uh, part of other sam <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so George is Mencap ambassador. Mencap's a leading um, kind of learning disability charity in the UK. Yeah. And we were aware of George and then watched him on Park Run. He did like a, a Sky documentary for Park yeah. Run. And um, yeah, we watched him and was like, he's amazing. And um, so we contacted his dad and was like, how do we meet George? And we went and met him on a service station mm -hmm. uh, okay. in the middle of between Manchester and Leeds because it just seemed like an easy place for us all to meet. And within half an hour, we were like, yeah. the part's yours. Amazing. Yeah. If it works, it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? yeah. So did you get it from the beginning that you had quite good chemistry and how did you work around it? Yeah, we, you, I, I came to the sketchy service station meeting and we sort of just, you know, had a, had a coffee and, um, and yeah, it was just, you, you know, you know, when you, you meet someone and you've got good chemistry with them and, and I think that's the sort of key thing you're, we, we're always looking for is just to work with people that we enjoy working with. I think the industry is so tainted uh, it, it, you know, every industry is, you know, people go to work and they just resent going to work. And I think if you have the choice to develop a crew and develop a team, then you may as well go to work and enjoy every minute of doing it because you're stuck in a rainy park in November, pretending it's summer. And, uh, you know, you're there for, for 10 hours. And, and, and so you want to enjoy yourself. And, and it just, you know, little moments like that, if you enjoy the chemistry with someone, then it's a no brainer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how much did you think you stuck to the original script and was there any improv involved obviously with your chemistry and with uh, the sense between you two? Yeah, so there was a kind of base script um, and then we did workshops with Sam and George and kind of improvised around mm. the ideas in that base script because we wanted, you know, we wanted George's experiences of a young man living with Down syndrome in the UK and people's views on sexuality and his experiences uh, to, to come into the story and be realistic and authentic. So a lot of the dialogue that you hear in the film comes from George and Sam from these workshops that we did together. Mm. Is that the same thing? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, George was really, really playful um, with, uh, with, with, with the way he approached the scripts and the way he, we sort of both, I remember just going and, and you know, just, just going to his house and playing a bit of Xbox and, you know, we'd take the, the script and we'd just chill on beanbags and, you know, we'd go over the lines and then we'd just, you know, not having not learned it and then just chuck it away and, mm -hmm. you know, go over the same lines but, but uh, reach there in different ways and, um, and yeah, he, you know, he was extremely liberating to, to bring that script to and then you get there on the day and you get such natural dialogue like that because it was just us 
chilling like we did and they it's just natural. happened to press record so it was yeah it was a pleasure to do really mm. how long did you rehearse for I had a few I don't know we did a one we did about maybe we did one full day of workshop mm. and then I, I'd gone and done and uh, just like hung out with him for a day uh, so like we just chilled and bounced some ideas off and went and got haircuts and had a few pints and, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah. Some of it came on the day, and like sort of the, the day. moment at the beginning of the film where he says I've got a crush on him, which is just before the, the kind of title comes up, George literally just did that yeah. and it wasn't, it, no one knew and we yeah. shot him and we're like, amazing, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah. like he just got the story and was passionate about, you know, bringing across this like beautiful love story between these two and, and he just knew it inside out, you both did, it just was a really nice organic filmmaking mm. process. It was really yeah, nice. Everyone's on the same page yeah. and it kind of works out, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I think that I think that was a key going forward is something I've realised that just like going forward and making films, uh, uh, you know, in the future is having everyone on the same page on day one, mm. you know, starting, you know, pre, pre-shoot is makes the world of difference to having to get there and people have different ideas and then get into action and going, actually, I don't know what you mean. That, the friction difference between those two, um, those two universes is, is miles apart. And it's, it's just such, uh, so much easier and more cohesive and flowing to all be on the same page to begin with. Yeah. Do you think there would have been a different outcome and how would you have handled it if everyone was not on the same page? I mean, I've had it before doing projects yeah, and it, it's yeah. very rare to find <laughs> people that that kind of gel and once you find them hold on to them I now work with you know Sam all the time because he understands and we work we've got this great chemistry working relationship together with Neil and Sam and and the crew that we work with like it's about finding those people that, that get yeah, it and are on the same page as you and and kind of working with them and obviously like, it's important to work with new people as well and bring people in mm. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but that's Every yeah. industry. Oh no, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so you won uh, the Audience Award. Did you expect that? And what was the feeling, the thought of that? Did you felt like the message resonated with people? Yeah, it was really nice to, to, to win that, I think, because, you know, we, we had quite a, 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 an interesting festival journey with the film, with some people mm. not necessarily getting it straight away. Yeah, so it's so, going to be the, the second version yeah. of the next <laughs> um, So, you know, it kind of came full circle with that for us, that, you know, winning the, the youth award for it and, and people accepting the film was a really beautiful moment for us when we were sat there because when the film was first sent to some festivals, um, we got some feedback saying they weren't sure if it was an appropriate film, if it was, um, you know, if there was uh, grooming elements in it between the two characters, was that okay to show? And I think it just comes from people not having the conversation and not understanding about it and, and, and being scared to talk about it and scared of getting it wrong. And if this film had got it wrong, then maybe we don't show it because it's, it, you know, let's just put it away in case you know mm. um, I think there's a long way to go still with disability and representation on screen and I hope that this film has you know pushed it forward a tiny bit and, and I'm hoping that we're going to make it into a feature and we can push that even further amazing yeah yeah was there ever a moment speaking about that uh, critique and those difficult moments that you yourself or uh, the rest of the cast and crew kind of questioned the idea of the film or the, the end product or were you always not at all, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, when, you know, myself and Neil have, have worked with people with, with disabilities for a long time, me and Neil, the co-director and writer, we used to be living carers, and we had, you know, we had someone who lived in our house that we looked after, you know, were supporting with a learning disability, who had a girlfriend who didn't have a learning disability. Mm. The guy that, that, that we were supporting had full capacity to make the decisions, to do whatever he wanted, to sleep with who he wanted, to have a relationship with who he wanted, mm. and, you know, that was fine. But I think a lot of people who are viewing that from outside, who maybe haven't even met anyone with a disability, are like, oh, maybe that's not okay. Yeah. Whereas it's just kind of education and, and people, you know. Knowing both sides. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got anything to ask? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> it was just a yeah. 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 No, it was, <clears throat> after that, I was, re- I, I, you know, came to that conclusion just a few weeks ago in that. Some people who, you know, I've, I've worked with, I, I clocked that I may have never met anyone with a disability and that I've just completely taken it for granted that, you know, I've grown up my entire life surrounded with disability and it has always just been something that I have perceived as 
normal life. But there are people out there who, and quite commonly, have ne you know never even met anyone with a disability, let alone worked with them. So you know that should never be perceived as a as a negative because it's just a given because it's about human experience and and you know we should we should allow those things to happen, but also allow conversation. You know. This story should make people uncomfortable because it's never been shown before. You know, if it didn't, then it then it, you know the the message and change wouldn't be necessary. Um, but it, it should make people uncomfortable as long as they're accepting a conversation to be had afterwards, which is the the interesting part of which we've you know clocked in. Young people are very open. The conversations we've had, you know, taking Iris round uh, up in Manchester, like these, uh, you know, young people, like people like you know yourselves, just just those. Uh, conversations led by the people who are going to lead the industry in 10, 20 future, years yeah. are the important ones to have. You know, all of these people who are like sh 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 stuck in their ways, like they could be gone soon anyway. You know, and you guys take over. Yeah. And that's how change is made. Exactly. Yeah. Like, not, dying off. <laughs> not, not that way, I'm in by conversation. And then the intelligent ones coming in and, and taking it up. But, yeah. so, yeah. No, 100%. Definitely not putting it under the bed yeah the exactly yeah, just yeah. just putting it out there yeah. and, and and having that dialogue because it's important it's okay for people to turn around and not understand and be like you know i'm working on a job at the minute and and um you know the the representation is uh absolutely unheard of you know behind the scenes and in front of the camera mm -hmm. and a lot of those people you know will have just met people with disabilities in a social aspect and not know how to work with them and work with them as a co-star or even as a you know as someone who is higher up than it is and that could be a really uncomfortable really uh, interesting dynamic for them to see and for them to learn from mm -hmm. uh, you know and, and we won't improve if we don't thrust yeah. ourselves into those situations right. in the first place yeah and Good things come from out of the comfort zone and being uncomfortable. Exactly, so. growing pain. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And it's interesting, that even if the film, if a film was made about grooming and someone had a disability and they were being groomed, why can't that story be told and shown anyway? anyway? Mm -hmm. It's not about that, but the fact that some festival said we couldn't get in in case it was about that just seemed absolutely crazy. Yeah. The film's not about that. It's a love story about two people who both have capacity, who are both the same age, who fall in love in school. But, you know, if it wasn't about that, the fact that they're saying, well, we can't show that, seems crazy anyway. Yeah. But anyway, it's an excuse. It, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. just excusing miseducation and, and uh, resistance to change, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, wonderful. Um, so both of you have worked in TV series on a different, completely different note. Um, uh, you've worked on uh, TV, TV shows. What is the main difference for you uh, from short film and film to TV? You think? Um, creative fulfilment, oh. probably. And, uh, uh, you know, if I could carry on, if I could choose and just, you know, have... Um, infinite money then I would just make my own stuff for the rest of my life because it's it's you I've never left a day on films that we've made being tired or in, in terms of just being and being begrudging I've always left feeling you know energized and wow that you know this is what I want to do whereas I have left you know more commercial jobs feeling drained because it, you, you know you have that corporate aspect behind it that's that's fueled by that um, consumerist culture, whereas there isn't as much within uh, within short filmmaking. It's it feels more integral, um, and you have more creative decisions. So it's a bit more soulfully gratifying making that stuff. It's a bit more integral. But yeah, I would say that's the main difference and speed. Yes, can be. I don't know, I've just got my first TV job, I can't say anything. <laughs> no, no, no. Tell us a bit more I'm about that. Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've just started training. Um, you know, I've, I've been working towards trying to get into television for years. And it's, it's it's and from the kind of, you know, filmmaker side of things, it's, you know, I've it's it's been hard to break through the door, even by making short films that, like, win awards and, you know, knock on the door. But I would say, if anyone in here, I don't know if you guys want to be film directors, TV directors, whatever is, just keep going. I applied for the BBC New Directors Trainee Scheme for eight years and I just got in this year so I would say keep going and keep doing it yeah and um, it's been amazing I've learned so much and I'm learning you know the differences between them film and, and TV but it's been incredible and I'm, I'm just about to start my first block on EastEnders and I, I um, I'm really excited and, and at the moment you know I haven't done it before so for me yeah. it's like oh my yeah. god I'm so excited it's kind of my yeah. first big kind of thing that I'm doing that's outside of it but um 
yeah, and just being creative on a on a different level, on a kind of level that's kind of more commercial, that's kind of out there. But mm. um, I don't know. Maybe ask me in a few years. But yeah. right now, I'm really excited. It's two different it's, sides. Yeah. Quite exciting, Sam's isn't been it? doing it since he was yeah. 14 yeah. on the TV yeah. side. So it's like you know, it is been doing it a bit long. Like it, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's a different ball game. You know, it's, yeah. it's just it's it's it's. Uh, you're sort of rather than being in a uh, you know in in like a really nice uh, cute little pond, you're in like a really fast flowing river, and you're sort of like there's not much control. You sort of just have to lie back and you know just appreciate it and enjoy it as you go through. And it is, I mean, it is phenomenal seeing uh, that it, it, it will never get boring going to work in uh, on like a big production where there's like. 40 people working on the same one page of dialogue and you're just like it will always be mind-blowing you know my grandma comes to the set and she's like oh god i can't Mom. believe how much i'm moving the set around television you've only you've only 12 hours to make do like a minute of yeah. telly and it's you know that, yeah. that will always be beautiful for a long yeah. amount of time as well it could be going on for years and seasons yeah, and seasons. 100%, 100%. yeah. but yeah it's you know it's a beautiful industry but um but yeah I, i'd say never lose doing your own stuff as well don't ever lose oh, yeah. that i mean i'm always going to make my yeah. own thing like, i think we've got another four projects out this year haven't we that we're yeah we'll always make money. time to do that even if it's just your phone in a park it will otherwise you get you know, I've met so many people who just, uh, that's all they do now and they, they've lost that's that all. and they become bitter and resentful and, and yeah. you just need to balance both worlds. If you want to be a storyteller, you're always going to have stories that you want to tell and it's inside me. I couldn't not be telling. I'm in, literally in the car with you being like, and then we could, this story and this, like, this, up, this story and this story and this story and this story. Like, if you're a storyteller, you're always going to keep wanting to tell stories and, you know, and it's quite beautiful because I've not really told other people's stories before and I'm quite excited to do that as well and kind of to explore that because I've always just told my own stories and... Gosh, you should write a book. <laughs> Very good quote. Um, so it's quite it's quite exciting to have that opportunity to tell other people's stories as well, um, mm. and find ways of finding creativity in that. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's a good balance between making your own work and also following something yeah, else that's more like regimented in a yeah, yeah. Nine, well, not nine to five because it's never nine to five, is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's also like you know you you can't. Uh, there, there's something amazing to be said for the audiences that those big. Uh, more commercial shows reaches and then the people that you meet on those jobs you then bring with you on your uh, to tell your other stories so like something like SAM you know all of the people and all of the reach that it's had you know I, to be able to bring people on board who who um, who are already on board with the stories you're telling because they've seen them on Channel 4 or something like that, to be able to then turn around and bring those people with your other stories as well and go, okay, you like this, okay, come with me and let me show you this that you wouldn't necessarily watch yeah. um, otherwise, you know, and, and, and using that voice to, to tell smaller stories. Um, I think there's something amazing to be said for that. And also, you meet so many people in a day on those big jobs, and you'll meet loads of people. We, we went and watched a film the other day, and the, the guy who directed that, you know, it was a little uh, uh, feature that he'd made, independent feature, and all of the crew and everyone on it was from the big stuff that he'd okay. done before, from the last two jobs that he'd done. You know, stuff like that. It's just bringing the team with you and yeah. stuff. It was good. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so you spoke about uh, doing more projects together. Can you tell us and how much can you tell us about that? Ooh. Well, we've just done a... It sounds really... It, <laughs> talking about like saying this project out loud makes it sound really shit. But actually, it's quite good. <laughs> I think, I hope. Take your word but for it. <laughs> it's a horror, musical, thriller, cartoon... Zombie. Zombie. Nazi. Nazi. So, so. <laughs> I'm hooked already. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It was loads of fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, like, it was, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, it's really fun. good. Basically, it's about a uh, LGBT bride who she's getting married, and her grandma-in-law is homophobic and gives her an amulet which transports her to different dimensions, where it's kind of like different mm -hmm. she's stuck horror-like scenarios. So she won't marry the granddaughter. But it's all while singing. Yeah. And well, one of them's a musical dimension. So she gets transported into these, so she can't never reach her bride. So she gets transported to this animation, and then she gets transported to this musical, and then transported to this zombie apocalypse. And so, this. so that was that was loads of fun to make. Really that good. Was great. That was so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like just making it was just like was insane. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so we've done that. Um, We've got a feature idea that we want to start making. We shot another, we shot another film called If. We shot as well. another film called If. Did that. So that's like half of it. 
is is in the past in sort of in his uh, in his memory and that was shot on analog we shot that on 35 mm. 16? 16 16 shot that on 16 mil yeah. and then the stuff that's in the present day is shot on digital and then we sort of combined the two and you know played them sort of side by side which was mm. that was really nice and then we've got another one in the pipeline we've got another feature that we want to make and a TV series that we want to pitch as well yeah so lots of exciting yeah. things. Yeah, whoa, whoa, okay. <laughs> That's really exciting. Yeah, do you ever, well, I mean, I hope all of us know the good old imposter syndrome that we were talking about earlier. Do you, when you watch things that you've done in the past, do you get that feeling of, oh, I could have done this differently, and do you bring that to the, your next project, and what's the biggest thing? Ooh. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's really tricky for me personally, because I edit my own projects as well, and I could just edit them forever. Like, you know, and I always go back and go, oh, I just wish I'd, I wish I'd just edited that, that differently and dice. sped that up. Split and second. I find it really hard to watch my, my stuff. Uh, it takes me a while. And then sometimes after a few years, I watch it and go, oh, actually, oh, it was fine. But I think it takes me a while to kind of move past that, I suppose. Um, I think it'll be nice to get other people to edit but sometimes you just don't have the budget. So you're just like, well, I'm just gonna edit it myself. And then you're stuck there in purgatory and the cutting being like, ah. Um, but yeah, I think it's natural too. And I think it's also good too, because you can learn from the mistakes that you've made and apply them to your, new, you know, your next projects. Yeah. And yeah, so I think it's quite, it can be healthy. Mm. What can do you think? be. What was, what was one that you yeah. recognized in like SAM, a mistake that you recognized in that that you carried over to either if or White Wedding? In SAM, mm. like a mistake that you did there that you didn't repeat, that you then... Well, it doesn't repeat. have to be a mistake, something that you... Well, like something that you recognised. That was what the question was, just the same one that you just bounced over the question. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that, I was like, just... Yes, <laughs> mate. Uh, You're like, uh, I, I don't make mistakes, I'm perfect. I'm like, no, that's <laughs> the edit. Like, the edit could have been quicker. Um, what do I think was a mistake in SAM? That's such an interesting question. It wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't read it as that when you asked me. I thought you just meant from past films, not SAM. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll just watch that, so we... <laughs> That's tricky. I think... Oh... Mine's the opposite. Mine's, I watch that, and it frustrates the fuck out of me, because that, to me, is one of the times where I feel like I got it, okay. and I've never been able to recreate it. Ooh. And I don't know whether that was a combination of the project or the character or something I did, but I've never been able to recreate that feeling with that character, mm. with any other character, like the years after that. So that's sort of the opposite flip side of that. And yeah, I've never felt, yeah, I've never felt like I've been able to achieve similar. I think I just wish we'd had more time to maybe, I just wish it had been longer, I think for me, which is like, I just feel like they're, they're, I wish we'd had more time to improvise, to, create more for depth with it and have more you know I think it's just a frustration of shorts sometimes where you know you kind of are like this could be a feature could have gone on the money to do yeah. it and we've only got this Good limited sense. time to shoot it and it's kind of like once you've got it you've not got time to get it again because we literally had two days in that park and we had eight hours a day for two mm. days so we didn't have any time um, mm. but I'm proud of it and I'm really I, I, I really love that film I think out of all the films I've ever made that's probably the one where I don't have many regrets from it. I think my other ones, I could probably sit here and talk for, for ages. Yeah. I mean, if you showed the first film I ever made, I would, I would talk all day about how awful it is. But I learned from it, and I loved that I made that film, but I, it was terrible. I made it on a credit card. I literally finished it, and I was like, fuck it, do you know what? I'm just going to make a feature film, because everyone's saying that I'm never going to get funding, that you can't, that it's so difficult, and da-da-da, you can't just do it out of uni. I was like, I'm just going to do it, and I did it, and it was bloody awful. But it got released, and I learned how to direct just making that. I didn't really learn how to do it from studying so much, which is probably not a great thing to say at university, <laughs> but I... Um, you I, learn on the job. <laughs> but I, I just went out, got people together and, and made a feature film and failed at loads of it and watched it back and was like, okay, I'm watching this like I would watch a film. What have I done wrong? And I learned from it and then made another one straight afterwards. And learned, I, think, I feel like that's how I learned how to direct, yeah, yeah. just by going out and making 90 minute film on no money and yeah. being like okay what's going to work what's not going to work it's problem solving isn't it yeah all of it, all of that's it. one thing i wish i'd gone to study for is failing and being in a safe space where it doesn't really matter in terms of 
you have the freedom to make mistakes and and you know not making them and and having them then broadcast to like two and a half million people and being like oh, oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> like I was like, I'll never next time. <laughs> I was delivering all my lines away from camera and <laughs> yeah you know just just having a space where you know you can safely make mistakes and come out of it and learn from them you know rather than making them on the floor which is obviously you still do like I make mistakes every single day at work um, but you know they could be you know uh, rectified quicker now <laughs> um, so yeah that's sort of something I would uh, take advantage of is failing yeah a little bit. and to be fair the university I went to we made I, I didn't get the chance to make many films which is I think why I had the frustration mm. of being like I'm gonna just go out and make, sure just make this film and then I was like oh my god it's got one star what the fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean and then I just learned from it and made more and just kept going I think I was like I think I did it I think I was 20 when I made my first like feature and I literally made it on my own and got a credit card out and it cost 800 pounds Everyone came and made, I, I put an ad up on the internet for DOPs to come and sound people and everyone had literally just finished uni and all turned up and the sound guy that came was a bit like, what the fuck's this? And I was like, I don't know, but let's just do it. <laughs> and we did it. And, um, and then it, it got released and then the sound guy that did that went on to the sound for Bohemian Rhapsody and still works on my films now because we just kept this relationship and just Crazy. kept going. And I think that's really important, yeah. you know, and, and like... I think it's important to keep the relationships that you've got at uni and help each other out. And like, it's such a hard industry. Like, you know, there's some people from my uni that, that didn't do that and kind of went off and were a bit like, fuck you all, I've made it, I've gone. Do you know what I mean? But like, they're not really friends with anyone anymore. Whereas like, I try and help people out and, and, and do, it's a community. You've got to help each other in this industry. It's a lonely place. Like, Let's say, like up, up north is very lucky. Manchester's the, the film industry up north is so small in that every single job I've done, there is always being always the been people. the same people on yeah. like you always have someone you know and that's something I know isn't the case down south not that I've worked much down south I think I've done like you know like two jobs down here but it's you know I, I know from other people that it's always been very difficult so like if you're just staying down south and working down south then keep the relationships that you've got at uni because you don't have that privilege of being in a small filmmaking community where you can just ring people up and you know go and debt favors here and there like just keep and build a community in the university space and then when you go on you know take those people with you otherwise you're just stepping out into a you know this massive world and it's good to be able to do exactly what Lloyd said and just as soon as you're out bam let's do it let's make a film in the real world and and bring those people and it's along. support as well because it's such a it's such a cutthroat like a rejection industry where you're gonna get times where it's so frustrating and to have other people that are on your side working with you and get it. Like I, you know, I've always had a filmmaking family by my side doing it because it's it, it, it pushes you to keep going and to just keep doing what you love. Because, you know, if you wanna be a filmmaker and you absolutely love it, there's probably nothing else you wanna do. And, you know, you've just gotta keep going, but just have that support network next to you, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, wow, that's very a very inspirational note to say. Should we open it up to some questions from you guys? Because I could sit here and ask till tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> um, did you shoot chronologically so that you allowed the um, characters to sort of blossom into that big moment at the end of the film? Um, we. It wasn't. It fully. wasn't fully, and the reason that it wasn't was because we were restricted with the essays and when they could come and when they couldn't. Um, which often it, you're kind of, especially if you've got no money, you're you're often restricted by kind of when people can come and help and when they can't, and when other cast members could, could kind of come in and out. So actually, we shot it out of sync, didn't we? It was pretty out of sync. Pretty it out was of sync. it was it was more sync than most. I think the kiss was filmed the last thing yeah. that we did. The, the, the yeah, end of the film that was at the end. Yeah, just of night. Um, but yeah, the rest of it was pretty out, um, which was great. <laughs> that would be fun I'd like to do that one day I'd love to shoot something chronologically make your life easier if you're doing a film and you can shoot it chronologically like just especially for post as well if you're editing it yourselves and stuff like that it's very rare that, that it's happens. very rare yeah yeah because yeah. Yeah. they yeah you'll never you, you won't get that on like commercial jobs White Wedding was pretty much chronological no it wasn't it was no it wasn't it was no it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> So we'll just do this all day. So we, shot, we, shot every, we shot per location. We no, I know, but it, but it was kind of chronological. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, but, uh, kind of going off of that, 
did you have any um, weather destruction? Yeah, freezing. Or, yeah, freezing. I mean, anything that stopped you from filming or delayed uh, or changed yeah, anything because of the weather or outside? Public. Do you remember, oh, it was people coming and, and coming to the park and being like, I want to go on the swings. And we were like, well, we're filming. And they were like, it's our swings. Yeah, I mean, it was stuff like that. And then you put on the script. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, people did it. Really? On the people. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a documentary. Yeah, yeah. Half like, documentary. She couldn't be in the film. <laughs> and then I was one point, I was like, smoking these herbal cigarettes in it. And she was like, eh, you can't smoke dogs here. And I was like, oh, they're herbal. It's all right. It's just like a, like if yeah. it was a bonfire. Like, it's yeah. just basically leaves. She was like, no, you can't smoke it here. Anyway, aren't you that guy off the telly? Oh, my God, you shouldn't be smoking. And then she's like, you can't smoke here. I was like, you're smoking real cigarettes. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just public on it. And yeah. people, like, with dog toys and stuff, like, just noisy. Yeah. Dead smoke was always cool. in the background. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, we think your character wouldn't wear a coat, even though it's like three degrees. I was like, okay, cool, great. And pretend it's summer as well. Oh, brilliant. Great. As is the case with every job. <laughs> so, yeah. Amazing. Yes. Any more questions? Um, yeah, I know you said about like you funded it with your credit card for your first one. What about your other films? Like, Where does the funding normally come from? Um, so far, kind of me working different jobs to try and save up and asking people for favours. I mean, with SAM, um, we asked a producer to come on board who managed to raise the 1,500 from a private investor, so that came from there, um, which is the first kind of time that's ever really happened. Um, I've always found the BFI funding forms a massive barrier. I'm so dyslexic, I find it so difficult to fill them in and to navigate them. I don't think they're very accessible. Um, and I've always massively struggled with that side of it, but I've kind of not let it stop me and I've found other ways of still being able to make my projects. Um, I know lots of people who fund their funds literally by emailing wealthy people and going, you know, like it's just building it up themselves and go, okay, you know, I know, you know, I've got this film that I'm going to make and I need two yeah. grand. And they get, you know, a thousand pounds from this person, a thousand pounds from that person, a thousand pounds from that person. They Which go, is actually what I have done before uh, with Closets. I made a short film and we emailed companies and said that we would put their logo at the end of the film and that we were going to do like a newspaper article in different papers. It was kind of local papers that they'd be involved in. So I think we asked each company for a thousand pounds and it was like different packages. And it was literally me and my mum just ringing them and cold calling like we were in a call centre and selling it to them down the phone and being like, you know, we can get you in this. It's going to be shown at hopefully this festival and, da -da 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 -da, and kind of just doing the whole spiel. And, and we managed to do it that way. So there's different ways you can do it to kind of, you know, and actually I used Kickstarter once and I think we raised, I think it may be, maybe 2,500 we got towards a project from Kickstarter. Um, and, and then I suppose you've got to sell your vision to crew and kind of be like, I want to make this film. It's really important to me. This film needs to be told because of this, that, whatever the issues are, whatever you want to kind of, break the barriers with what story you want to tell and get people on board with the same passion who are DOPs, sound people, like different yeah. you know, departments. And usually they'll be like, you know what, I'm off this weekend, I love making films, let's make a film. That happens in the North, I've not experienced it anywhere else, but in the North there's a massive filmmaking community where people are up for literally making films at the weekends, you know, so. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I was just gonna say, actually it's growing quite like Bournemouth now. Um, Amazing. I've, so the group that I'm in, there's, there's quite a lot of us <coughs> and we go about various different films and we see each other quite often and a lot of the time it is free. Mega. There you go. Yeah. We love making films. We love making yeah, films. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's just about finding those communities. I mean, Facebook, it was at least, you know, uh, I don't know what it's like now, now but um, it was at least, you know, five years ago, the main place where I would find anyone who was making a film that weekend and you just, you know, all of these groups and stuff. Um, that was always really good. And just making our budgets as small as possible, going into it, knowing we had as many favours called and only paying for the essential stuff. Like White Wedding was pretty much all, well it was all, it was all privately funded by us and it was all built by us because we knew it was our money. So we were like, how can we make this as tiny as possible? And we were like, you know, borrowing things and just like on the side, like, oh, we need a, you know, a stack head on the wall or something like that, you know, just, just tooth and nail, just asking for favors from a hundred different people. And, you know, you'd get maybe like five 
bits and bobs for your set. And, you know, and so don't be cool. afraid to reach out to people that you think are unreachable to help you with your films. Oh, like, gotcha. You will be so surprised. So we had a musical number in White Wedding and Neil, who works with us, was like, I want the guy that wrote the Take That and the Spice Girls songs to write the music for this. And who writes for like, uh, he does, he's a Grammy Award winner, he's Find Neverland on, the, on Broadway in New York. Like he's, he's one of the biggest music producer in the UK at the moment. He does all the big hits that are coming out. And uh, Neil was like, I'm just gonna message him. And we were like, well, he's not gonna do it. And he messaged him on Facebook. And a week later, we were in his studio and he did the song for us. You know, you just sell sell what sell your vision, and, you, and yeah, if, you, if you're passionate about it and love it and believe in it, likeness is other people will as well. You know, hundred and and message people. I mean, I messaged for uh, closets a short I made. I was like, I, there was a DOP that I loved that I'd seen loads of programs with on TV, and I found his email address on LinkedIn and emailed him. I met him the next week in a coffee shop. Was like, I don't have a lot of money to make this. This is my vision. I want to do it, and he did it. You know, and he brought all of his kit with him and all of his people like. <laughs> Just ask people, because all they can do is say no, but actually, a lot of the time, they might say yes. I mean, a lot of the, I mean, yeah. Paul, another one, he was, he was. It, it, you, you'll find that people just having those conversations with people and not just straight out asking them, but talking to them first and building a relationship first. Because also you might meet them and then they might be a nightmare and you're like, oh, you know, wish I'd just got my mate to do it. But when you meet them, you know, you might find that shared passion of either something about the key message of the film or about the, you know, about being, anti the commercial stuff you know he was he was massively yeah i hate that that was what we gelled on was the beer but hating the bfi funding apps and he was like yeah absolutely oh, mate couldn't think of anything worse I think it's nepotism all of this 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 and this and he basically did it for free you know brought all his gear it's absolutely phenomenal um and we just had that shared experience of just like you said mate, just wanting to make films yeah so that's, at, at the end of the day you'll find a lot of people who do just want to make films who are sick of the monday to friday being on commercials lighting stuff just you know doing that corporate consumerism uh, who if you've got a really refreshing energy and are like it's community projects and sell it as this com you, you know you're making this film community and you want to yeah. tell this story then those people are likely also going to want to come on board and enjoy that process because they are fun I've never been on a short film that hasn't been fun mm -hmm. like they just you enjoy yourself so much so it's yeah what about, sorry, what about in terms of like equipment like getting favors from people and stuff. So some some people some people have their own gear. You know, you have got your own kit. There you go. Um, <laughs> you know, some people some people come along with their own gear. Some people we know people who have gear but don't do those jobs. You know, they just collect gear. We very fortunately have saved up and bought a bit of our own gear. So you know, yeah. we've got uh, some camera gear and sound. So gear. when I did my first feature, the DOP that came and did that had his own lights, his own camera and shot that. Uh, the same with the guy who I contacted who was a big TV DOP. He brought all his own gear. Um, if you contact a DOP that you want to work with, the likeliness is, he's going to have a lot of cameras. Um, you know, it, it just depends, I guess, who you... Also, also rental. And I don't know, I don't know how it works with the unis when you guys leave. Can you still access that department? No. 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 Not officially. No. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, kit rental. I you know it's expensive, but factoring that into your budget. But you can hire. So even if you hired stuff like, you know, even if you found an independent hire, like someone who had like a, you know, an Ursa or a, or like a, even a Black Magic. Like if you just wanted to shoot something really small budget, to hire those for the day aren't going to be mega expensive if you're factoring that into your budget. And likeliness is. If, you're, if you work with people who have a little bit of experience in the industry, they're going to know someone who knows someone because they'll have done a job with someone. You know, it is quite a common thing. To, to, you, you could to hire the camera that SM was shot on probably for like, what, 70 quid a day, maybe? You could probably find What do you reckon? Like an Ursa? Ursa uh, 6K? Yeah, about, yeah, about 70. Yeah, yeah. They're not like they're not out of this realm. And in terms of like, and then and then it just comes to improvise, and then it comes to like, do you know, what, okay, well, you know, get a, you know, spend a bit of budget on a really fast lens and shoot it with candlelight and reflectors and stuff like that. You know, like uh, saving up, jumping on Amazon and just getting to it. On a budget, yeah, it's it? being creative on a budget, and you then you come up with some mad ideas, like some of the some of the random stuff we've come up with, like horror film. Well, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we we shot some absolutely mental stuff for zero budget, and 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 you just you know you improvise, you use natural light, you, you just go all right, fine, we shoot outside, and uh, and yeah, you you get creative. That's 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 about it until you until you have that budget, and then you start playing with toys and stuff. 
Not that we've got there yet, but yeah. <laughs> the ambition. Yeah. I want toys. <laughs> I, want big toys. I want big lights. <laughs> For the warmth. Um, any more questions? Um, I noticed that George's character, um, he didn't choose to subtitle um, his dialogue. Is that a, a, a direct decision that you made? Because in, in, I noticed that a lot of depictions of disabled um, individuals in film and TV, they're subtitling them, they're kind of like, almost like treating them as different members of the cast in a way. Mm -hmm. Almost like when they speak, you know, it's almost like they speak a different language. Was that a decision you wanted to make to... Well, we are interested to ask once. What if it was with subtitles? No, to subtitle it. Yeah, there's been a couple of accessibility f screenings where they've subtitled it, which is... But subtitled the whole film? Yeah, the whole um, film, yeah, not George. No, George has never just been subtitled. Yeah, I mean, I think that comes from, you know, yeah. um, is wanting audiences to, you know... make. It comes from the privilege of growing up around people with disabilities and, and, and not having, not going into the film with that prelim of alienation. Yeah, and, and I think Neil would say, and he has said it before, who co-wrote it and directed that, he wants people to, you know, experience maybe what it's like to, to, to see someone with a disability and how they speak without having to have subtitles there and, and experience that and interpret yeah. it and be like, you know, feel that because a lot of people have never met anyone with a disability yeah. before and will meet somebody probably in their life with a disability and they won't you have wouldn't subtitles. have subtitles in real exactly. life. Exactly, yeah. so I think that's what Neil's answered that question with before. With, with, Neil felt quite strongly that he didn't want subtitles on the film full yeah. stop, so I guess that kind of comes from that. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, if, if someone was, you know, if someone had had a, a strong accent that wasn't English, you know, they wouldn't get subtitled in a film. So why should someone with a disability? Exactly. You know, why should someone really, with... It's really refreshing, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I don't think it was, yeah. Yeah, it's just really interesting, that, isn't it? Because they do, you, you know, it, it, it does happen very frequently, but we don't, we don't do it with, with, you know, neurotypical people with speech impediments, yeah. do we? You know, so so why why should it, why why should it go for someone with a disability? It's it, it, it's it's a really interesting. It is is a really interesting one. I know Neil felt very strong because about it as well. I don't know what what would you do if you were doing a film and and people were speaking sign language in the film, but they weren't verbalising the sign language. What would you do if you were making a film and it was and it was a conversation in sign language? Because I saw a theatre piece recently, and there was a scene and they stopped uh, verbalising the speech and and. Spoke in sign language. <coughs> what would you do? It's a difficult one. Because <laughs> you're essentially speaking a different language, aren't they? Yeah. Start like stopping the film and start speaking it's Italian. Depends if it can be it can be understood by the context of what's going yeah. on. Um, yeah. 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 If it's a lot of conversation, then you'd have to subtitle it. Yeah. But for like they would lose it. But that's a very good point. If the context yeah, is obvious, I, I think it's almost important to not subtitle it. Then oh, it's way better if you can avoid subtitling yeah. anything. Then you yeah. open the door to you know actually trying to investigate and, mm -hmm. and learn and observe yourself. And For sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Nah, it's good questions, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any more of those great questions? <laughs> Amazing. I actually did have one last question because uh, obviously with uh, writing your own work and making your own work, there comes the amazing, amazing world of writer's block how do you navigate that and uh, how do I navigate that I I don't know <laughs> that's such a hard question um, what do I do to navigate it I kind of move away from it and come back to it I suppose and um, try and get people to read as I'm writing as well and give feedback um, I find really important and also get actors to read and perform your work and hear it out loud because once you hear an actor reading the lines sometimes you can be like Fuck, that's terrible like I need to rewrite that do you know what I mean like I, but you but if, when you get on set if you've not had any actors read it and you get there and they start performing it and then you're like oh fuck and it's like too late then you've got to shoot it you know like you can't really change it on the day <laughs> so I try and get actors to read it maybe get them to read it again with the script away and improvise around the scene. You usually get more natural dialogue by doing that and then you can go back to the to the page and, and keep writing. Um, I'm lucky enough to have like a massive pool of actors around me that I've kind of collected that I can kind of bring in now to, to yeah. like read my scripts for me. Um, 
like I'm making you do it on Thursday, aren't I? We do read stuff and then read the lines. Read yeah. the lines. <laughs> like, yeah. And just pester people and ring them up and be like, I want you to read my script. Like, even if they hang up, just ring them back. <laughs> Thank you. It does change. <laughs> yeah. It makes your work better and, you know, yeah. That's what I'd say. Amazing. Have we run out of time? I think we've got five minutes. I was just going to ask a question to you, Sam, about how, how do you prepare for a role and a character? What's that process and how's that changed from obviously starting in the industry quite young to now, if it's changed at all? Or if you have a process? Depends what it is. Um, depends, depends what the content is, depends what the uh, style of the performance is. So this was very, you know, uh, I don't know how you would describe uh, the, the, you know, style of acting in this. It's very colloquial, is that the right word? You know, it felt very much like, you know, what you see in the film is exactly how me and George were like when we would go for a beer. So that was the prep for this film was, okay, I know how that is going to be like this on the day. So I need to go up and, you know, we need to spend some time together and to, to further develop that. Um, something like uh, the character that I played in Corrie, that was very, because it was medically based in terms of you were taking off something, you know, a very real disorder that I don't have in real life, um, you know, fictitious illness disorder, which is something that, you know, real people have. So there was, it felt like a very big responsibility with that to get that right clinically and also um, you know, contextually and also sort of like as a person as well. So I was, it wasn't like a, a dramatic showing of it. It was, it was a, a real telling that, that told them as real people, not patients, you know, which I think can be, because it's not, it, it was a bit careful that it wasn't dramatized too much. So it was very much about meeting real people for that. So that was a different sort of prep. Um, you know, things I've done, period things I've done, that's a very, uh, again, educationally prepping, just being contextually aware of all of the subject matter. Uh, whereas if it's something new like this, the essay and stuff, then it's more internal and introspective. Um, but a lot of my work, I suppose I'm pretty crap at prep, to be honest, like I do that. And then music mainly, I just make a playlist for every character and then I just like sit and listen to music and sort of get into that. Um, headspace, um, but not massively. It's more on the day. I'll we'll put the costume on and then we do it. But yeah. What's mm. the biggest struggle you have when approaching a character? Like the first thing that you're like, oh. Um, being careful to make decisions they would make, not decisions you would make, and that sort of crossover. Um, White Wedding was a really difficult one because with these guys getting, you know, getting involved, being involved in the creative process and being in it at the same time was very difficult because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I built the set for White Wedding, I was in a park, I didn't build a park, um, but it was set in this bridal suite and so we had a film studio and we were building this set and I was literally like, you know, like, like building a room and like putting up these ceiling joists and then these would be like, all right, Sam, so uh, about the scene where you talk to him, what are you thinking in that moment? I'd be like, shut up, I'm doing it, I'm doing this up now. You know, and they'd be like, oh, I'll take your hat off, we need to do this and rehearse this. I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, so that was very hard, just differentiating um, nice. how to, when to turn off one brain and when to then turn the actor brain on. And then I'd be on set and like, trying to be an actor and then they'd be like, someone's dying in the corner, you need to be a producer now. I'm like, okay, fine. You know, and then like go and like clean the floor or something. So, uh, so yeah, but that's always fun. I mean, that was the, the project we just done, the crazy zombie horror film animation one was the best because we literally did, you know, every minute of that was hand built by us. Um, and, and, and Neil, you know, the three of us. It's like we, a child, that film. It was, a, yeah, like, like, like we did every aspect everything. of it. And I would sat, I'd be sat there like, I never watched my own stuff, I really struggled to that, very self-critical, but for that I had to colour grade the film. And I was like, <laughs> so I was literally sat there, Lloyd would come in, and I'd be like, I'd just skip over all the other people, like, oh, she, she can have a basic colour grade, and that'd be on me, like, <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd would come in three hours later, like, you're still colour grading the same frame of your face. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was a very difficult one because you felt so attached to it because you did every aspect of it. Um, but that is a feeling that um, 
was also incredible and that I, you know, you will never get that again to make something where you literally, it's just a team of, you know, a few of you and you do every aspect of it is, you know, irreplaceable mm. feeling, yeah, to be able to, to have that much control over a project and what it looks like and feels like. Mm. You haven't seen the finished film? Well, we have, we have, we have, yeah, yeah, now, yeah, we've done it been now. Out, like literally a few days ago. Picture locked it, so yeah. amazing. But I've seen. When are we going to get to see it then? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, maybe that one's a bit mental for <laughs> Iris. <laughs> I don't know. What, I don't know what. The, don't know who's going to like judging that panel of Iris. So, uh, <laughs> Quite out. I'm gonna think when they watch it, <laughs> and there's people's heads being bashed in and blood splattering everywhere. I but think there'll be we'll like say. I don't know, like a niche audience in like a cave in Iceland. <laughs> like, like the film, and be like, wow, this. We've is entered great. it into everything, so who knows? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm very intrigued. It was great fun to yeah. make, and that's all it's about. Sounds isn't it? intriguing. It's just about though. enjoying yeah. it, you know. Yeah. yeah. We'll screen it. No, that's Pixar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll be back. Oh, if no one else. Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. So, yeah.